Let's pray. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Lord Jesus, be with us this morning. Father God, show us your love this morning. Holy Spirit, work through your word, work through me, work in our hearts and speak to us. And Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. So do you remember Easter Sunday? Easter Sunday, we talked about disappointment with God. We talked about Mary and the disciples and how they must have felt just after the crucifixion when they had no belief that Jesus would come back. And we talked about how it can feel when we're in the middle of God's timing and we don't understand it, when we don't know what God's timing means. We talked about how it feels to have hoped for so much from God and then found that what we were expecting didn't happen, didn't work out. There are times when we might feel disappointed with God. But do you know how it feels when you know in yourself that you have disappointed God, that you are the disappointment, to realize you have failed God. Well, Peter did. You know Peter, Peter the rock, Peter who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountainside, Peter who walked on water, Peter who declared Jesus as the Christ, the first disciple to say, you are the Christ. He knew how it felt to disappoint Jesus. And when he let Jesus down, he let him down big time. He really did go the whole hog. He'd been told he would do it. He swore he wouldn't do it. Then he did it. And then, not just that, the person he let down came back from the dead to talk to him about it. Now, I'm guessing we can all know a bit about how this feels. Do you know how it feels to let somebody down a bit? Do you know that look your mum gives you? Do you? Do you know when she says, Benjamin, no, Benjamin, that's it. Benjamin, Benjamin, I'm not angry with you. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> And your heart goes down into your boots. Maybe she didn't call you Benjamin. That might be a <laughs> personal experience. But you know that kind of look that your mum or a teacher or somebody you love, you're hoping to impress, and then, I've let you down. Or when you've really properly let someone down. You know, when you're older and you've made a commitment, you've given your word, and you've given your word and your love to somebody you care for and you love and you love and then you have to face them and say I've let you down I failed you and see the disappointment in their eyes well we must know how that feels so take that feeling and times it by 10 and imagine how Peter felt how Peter felt at this moment in the reading we have but I'm beginning to feel like I might get a rep reputation for being over serious. Do you think? It's a bit of a downer. I'm not usually this much of a downer on, on Sundays. Do you know? Easter Sunday, disappointment. Last Sunday, doubt. This Sunday, being a disappointment. Oh, it's miserable. I blame the Bible. <laughs> it's really not my fault, you see. <laughs> Easter Saturday really is quite a sad time. And then Thomas and Peter, they did put themselves in really sticky situations. They did make their time pretty miserable. And on the serious side, part of the joy, part of the wonder of the redemption of Easter and the joy of salvation is the darkness that preceded it. Do you know, part of the, the superness of the gracious gift of grace 
is how little we deserve it, how little we've earned it. But to break the seriousness bubble, I'm going to tell you a story. So once upon a time, somebody invented an inflatable church. It's a very practical idea. You can put them up very quickly, take them down again. They're easy to clean. They're waterproof. You can transport them, put them up wherever you like. An inflatable church. But this inflatable church also had an inflatable pastor. <laughs> Which again, if you think about it, is quite a practical idea. You can put him away in the cupboard between Sundays, and he's already full of hot air. <laughs> and the inflatable pastor had an associate pastor. And he was also inflatable. Now try saying that with a mouth full of marshmallows. The inflatable associate pastor one day took a thumbtack. Is that what we call them? No, we call them drawing pins. He takes a drawing pin. <laughs> no, he takes a thumbtack. And in a fit of peak, he pops the church. And the church deflates. Then he takes the thumbtack and he stabs the pastor. Then he takes it and he stabs himself. So there you have a deflated church, a deflated pastor, and a deflated associate pastor. And they're lying deflated on the floor like this. And the pastor flaps his flappy arm over to the associate pastor and he flaps over his flappy face and he says Johnny, because that was his name Johnny you've let the church down <laughs> I'm going to keep going <laughs> Johnny you've let the church down you've let me down but worst of all, you've let yourself down. <laughs> I think that might be too silly. <laughs> Does anybody here own a boat? Does anyone have a boat? Raise, raise your hand if you own a boat. Ooh. That keep, is that your right hand? Keep it your right hand. Does anybody here wish they owned a boat? Can you raise your left hand? Okay, look around. I think the left-handed people and the right-handed people should get together. <laughs> Have a little chat about boats. So, a few people here own a boat. Has everyone here been on a boat? We're kind of boating. A lot of people know about boats. Well, my uncle owned a boat, Uncle Gray. He wasn't really my uncle. He was a kind of cousin of my grandfather's. But we called him Uncle Gray. And Uncle Gray lived in Cornwall, which is a place in England on the bottom southwest corner. And it's beautiful kind of coastline, sea. And he took me and my brothers and my parents out on his boat. When I was about yay high, we were small. And he drove out to sea. And he took some mackerel lines. He had about five or six. And do you know what a mac mackerel line is? like a very long fishing line with a weight on the bottom. And it's got about five sparkly bits on which are attached to the hooks. No bait. He lowered them down. He pulled them up and they came up full of fish. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. He was just pulling them up. So we all put them down, we brought them up, each one came back with about five fish on it. And we had a wonderful afternoon pulling up mackerel, filling the boat with mackerel. Then he gutted the mackerel and threw the guts to the seagulls and they came along behind us as we drove the boat home. We must have caught about 200 mackerel. We came to the shore, he gave the surplus to some people on the quay, we went home, and we ate mackerel. It's a very strong memory in my mind. It's a wonderful thing. The other thing that sticks in my mind is the straight face he kept, because years later it turned out he'd never caught a mackerel before. It, was just a, it just happened that day. We were very fortunate that day. But have you ever eaten a fish that you've caught yourself, cooked yourself, Maybe on an open air fire, on a barbecue. Just get that taste in your mind. That taste of a fish that you've caught. It's incredibly fresh and it's freshly cooked. Mm -mm -mm. It's a great flavor. 
Can you imagine our passage? Can you imagine being there with Jesus? These guys have just been doing what I was just talking about. They've been out all night. They've been working. They've sailed into shore. And just waiting for you is a fire. Out all night you come in and there's a fire on the shore and there's bread and there's barbecued fish. It's a lovely, refreshing, restorative thing to be eating after a hard night's work. That's part of the story that we heard read. But there's more to the story. The disciples have been out fishing with no success. They went fishing out of desperation. They didn't know what else to do. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'll come. They all go. They'd spent three years following Jesus, and then he had left. They had seen him, but it seems that they didn't know what to do after that point. And now, they don't know what to do. So they went back to their first jobs. This seems quite natural. What should we do? Well, I'm a fisherman. Let's go fishing. They do need to eat, whatever happens. So this is a kind of desperation, I believe. They go fishing in desperation, and they fail. Their fishing trip is a failure. They catch nothing all through the night. So I'm guessing they're feeling pretty miserable, probably a bit tired because they're not used to the late nights anymore. And then a stranger said to them from the shore, have you caught anything? No. That could be quite annoying, couldn't it? You've not caught anything. Have you caught anything? No, we have not. Then he says, why don't you try dropping your nets on the other side? They don't know who's saying this, so they, they could be rather um, frustrated at this point. Even more annoying. Or maybe they're remembering. They're remembering the time that a teacher they didn't know told them to do the same thing. Maybe they thought, who are you to give us advice? But whatever they thought, they did it. They put the nets on the other side, and the nets are filled, miraculously filled. And both their problems are solved at the same time. The lack of fish problem was solved. That's one. But more importantly, the problem of what they were supposed to do with themselves was solved. Because immediately, the disciple Jesus loved realized that it was the Lord. And Peter swam to him. Imagine this. Imagine this emptiness and the sense of failure taken away in a moment. And then they sit down and they have breakfast together. And I like that bit. I like the simple things that Jesus says. Bring some of the fish. Come and have breakfast. The risen Lord attends to their physical comfort and he shares some time with them. There you are. Come and have breakfast. Then, they go for a walk. They walk, I guess, along the shore. This is simple and normal. People going for a walk. Except, this is the risen Lord. And he has some serious talking to do. Jesus takes Peter for a walk, and the disciple Jesus loved followed them. This is Peter's first opportunity to talk to Jesus about his betrayal of him. See, all the disciples at this point are stepping into a brave new world. Their new world is truly realizing who Jesus is and what that means for him. They thought he was dead. They'd been overjoyed to see him. They'd received the Holy Spirit. They had received his commission. They know he is sending them out. And Thomas, after his doubt, has made the ultimate realization of who Jesus is. My Lord and my God. But they must be trying to work out at this point how they are to relate to Jesus. After they've known him for so long, how do you relate to somebody who you say, my Lord and my God to? What is Peter thinking? He knows he's betrayed Jesus three times. He remembers that Jesus had foretold what he would do. 
What does he expect Jesus to say to him? You remember how it happened. Jesus had told his disciples, you will all fall away. And Peter had said, even if they fall away, I never will. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before the crock crows three times, you will disown me. And you remember Jesus was being tried and people came up to Peter and said, aren't you one of his followers? And he had said, who, me? No, no, I've never heard of him. Three times. Well, Peter the rock had crumbled. He had let Jesus down. And Jesus needed to talk to him about it. So when they had finished eating, they went for a walk together. Jesus says to him, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He asks him three times, do you truly love me? And Peter responds three times. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He does not understand what Jesus is doing. He is hurt because Jesus asks him repeatedly. Maybe he's hurt because he notices that Jesus is not calling him Peter. He's calling him Simon. He does not understand, but he answers Jesus' question three times. Jesus asks him three times. He answers three times. He is restored. Feed my sheep. His three-time denial, his betrayal, is replaced with a three-time avowal and commissioning. He is restored, just like being restored by a cooked breakfast and being restored by being a successful fisherman. Peter is restored. But what is he restored to? He is restored to serve, to look after the young and the old, to care for them and to feed them. And what will his reward be? At the end, he will die. Verse 19 says, Jesus said this to indicate the manner of death by which Peter would glorify God. It's usually assumed that this means, uh, it indicates that Peter was going to be crucified. We know that Peter was treated as the chief among the apostles. But did Jesus say to him, lead my people, govern my people, rule my people? No, he said to him, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed them. Take care of them. There is a lesson here for all in church leadership. We are called to serve. Peter's commission from the Lord was to serve, to feed, and to care. And there's three very important lessons for us here, I believe. The first is about being restored. The second is about leadership. And the third is about the church. Do you recognize how Peter felt? Do you ever feel like Peter felt? Have you disappointed God by failing, by lying, by breaking your word, betraying your promise, or just by running away? Peter did all of these things. And Jesus restored him and gave him a mighty task. We too can be restored. Have you failed? Have you taken off on your own path? Have you given up on God? Well, you can be forgiven and taken back 
and restored, just like working all night with no success and then filling your net in the morning, just like being up all night tired and hungry and coming back to a cooked breakfast. And just like Jesus saying to you after a very unpleasant betrayal, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Jesus can restore you if you love him, if you turn back to him. Jump out of the boat, shouting, it is the Lord. Swim to the shore and he will feed you. He will walk with you. He will forgive you and he will put you on his course. The second lesson is about leadership. Has anybody here been on any type of management training? Was it fun? I did some management training when I was a kid. No, when I was, I can't remember. I worked as a, I was a graduate trainee bank manager. <laughs> fresh out of college. And I went to uh, the bank headquarters and was given management training. Well, one thing that struck me about management training and also about a bit of leadership training with the military is how much they have poached from Jesus. Did you notice that? If you look at some of the things, that the way they advise people to lead, the uh, Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, its motto is serve to lead. They stole that straight from Jesus. Lots of management training covers trying to act like you love people and care for people, putting others first, leading by example. They got it all from Jesus. All of us have an opportunity to lead. It does not matter what you do in life. We each have the opportunity to lead because we each influence people around us. We influence our friends, our neighbors, our families. And we can influence them for the good or we can influence them for the bad. In many ways, you will be leading people in their decisions. Some of us will be leaders by being parents. Mothers and fathers lead their children. Some of us will be in leadership positions in work or in church. What kind of leader are you going to be? How are you going to lead? Be leaders like Jesus. Jesus serves. Jesus demonstrates practical love. Jesus leads by example. Jesus gently rebukes. Jesus restores. Jesus commissions others with tasks. Let's see if we can be leaders like Jesus. Not just in church, but in every aspect of our lives. And the last lesson for us is about the church, his church. Jesus, we see from this passage, intended for the church to follow him. He expected the church to grow after his ascension. He prepares his church. We are the church that Jesus founded. Jesus commissioned Peter. Peter passed the message on. Other people passed the message on. It got passed on. Eventually, it got here to Trinity Streetsville. We are the church. So how should we, as his church, be? How should we be as Jesus' church? Well, the first thing I take from this is we must love Jesus. When Jesus is commissioning Peter, he does not say, Peter... Have you passed your management course? Do you have a university degree? Do you have pots of money? He says, do you love me? Do you love Jesus? That is your first necessary qualification. Loving Jesus. We might be a wonderful church. We might have a fantastically beautiful building. 
We might have fabulous facilities and highly trained staff and fantastic parking. But without, without love, without the love of Jesus, we're nothing. Number one, love Jesus. Number two, we must feed his lambs. Jesus calls the first leader of his church. Jesus calls the church to feed his lambs. We are to nurture young Christians, to teach and care for them, both adults and children. Are we good at that? I think we're quite good at that. I think Trinity Streetsville has made a lot of effort put a lot of time, set up the right things for this to happen. That doesn't mean we can't do more. At this church, we must feed the lambs. When I was uh, preparing to be ordained, I, I uh, got to go on a retreat. It's really ra- rather nice going on a retreat. At some point, we'll have to go forwards, but retreats are fun too. Uh, So I was going to be ordained by the Bishop of Carlisle. And at this point, the Bishop of Carlisle lived in Rose Castle, which is a kind of redstone castle in Cumbria. And I went and spent three nights there. It was a silent retreat. It was great. I really liked it. Anyway, the night before I was ordained, the bishop called us all in, and uh, he said to us, disciple the children. I can't remember the exact words. But his point was, what he said was, before you go and do exciting evangelism, before you go and door knocking or putting Jesus videos through people's doors and doing uh, clever surveys that make people think about their faith, before you set up wonderful uh, Christian basics courses, look after the people that God gave you first. He said, people are bringing their children to church and we're letting them down. They're being brought. They're being uh, given to be discipled. And it's our duty to look after them. And that's stuck with me for ever since. That we have to disciple, evangelize the children. We must feed the lambs. And I think at Trinity, we are doing all right at that. We're doing quite well. We, We have children's work. We have youth work. We have... Uh, staff, and we have volunteers, and we do care. Oh, shouldn't do that. We do care. (laughs) We do teach, and we nurture, and we do try to uh, guide teens, particularly in a particularly confusing world. We must welcome and guide new Christians so that they do not become like the seeds that are choked by weeds. Number three, Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Love the followers of Jesus. Keep Jesus' followers from harm. Do we do that? Do we love each other here? Are we caring for each other as Christ's flock here? We have some excellent structures to help with that. We have a small group system, which is brilliant. You particularly need a small group system in such a large church because it can be quite easy to come to a church this size on a Sunday morning and get a bit lost. Do you know, to uh, be, everyone thinks that you know everybody else, so nobody talks to you. And you come Sunday after Sunday and you never meet people. We have a welcome desk and a small group system so that everybody can get into a small group where they are cared for, where they are nurtured, where they are helped. We have Stephen's ministry, which is great. I've been reading about it, and I'm going to go and see them next Wednesday. Stephen's ministry for caring for people. We have the CAP. The CAP project is brilliant, and we run it here. We have coping ministry. These structures are the beginning. They work when they are about people. They're about people caring for people. They are tools for connecting people, but it is the connected people who do the caring. It's not just a structure. The next stage 
is that we are people caring for each other as Jesus called us to. Number four, Jesus says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. How do we feed the sheep? What do we feed them with? We feed them with his word, with solid food. That is why we devote time and effort to Sunday teaching. We could have a three-minute sermon that I invent off the cuff. Just waiting to see. See, he was like, oh, could we? (laughs) Next week, just three minutes. I don't mind if you invent it off the cuff. We used to call that um, the three-step sermon. The uh, preacher would invent the sermon in the three steps it took him from his chair to the pulpit. Three-step sermon. But here, we devote time and effort to this communal communal act of worship. Because our love for Jesus means that we know we need to be fed. We feed the sheep. We make a weekly commitment to small groups where we study the word in greater depth and we get the opportunity to look at applying it more individually to our own lives. We run an annual Alpha course. Oh, yes, we do. We will. This, I think this autumn, we're going to start running an annual Alpha course. It's a refresher course for established Christians, and it's a Christian basics course for new Christians, and it's evangelism for those who aren't Christians. We, Christ's church, if we love him, are called to feed the sheep, to be fed and to feed. And we need to take this seriously. If we love Jesus, we will feed his lambs. If we love Jesus, we will take care of his sheep. If we love Jesus, we will feed his sheep. And we will be his church here. Amen.